The Japanese metropolis of Tokyo, where capital, wealth, and human resources are concentrated. It takes more than economic strength for poor rural areas to compete with such mighty urban centers. This is evident in the failure of the economic-focused development policies of the past. So, what new approach is needed for these rural regions? The Community Capacity Development and Policy Structure Model offers an alternative. The model shows us that for the rural community to survive, they need confidence and vision. Development policies that are made by them built on their own experience from their perspective and progressed by their will are essential. This film introduces the case of Oyama, which is demonstrative of the type of approaches advocated by this model. The film portrays actual implementation of many of the development activities. Oyama is in the heartland of Kyushu. It's only an hour's drive from Fukuoka. Surrounded by forested mountains, only around 3,000 people live in this tiny community. The town's slogan is, let's plant plums and chestnuts and go to Hawaii. This slogan has its roots in a history of Oyama people working together to achieve their vision for a better future. Oyama is said to be the prototype for One Village, One Product, or OVOP, now a global movement. It's not One Village, One Product, is it? It's more like One Village, One Hundred Products. Says Hideo Ogata, who was an employee of Oyama's local government, he worked on creating Oyama's successful policy reforms. I think the main aim of OVOP is to give the town an identity. Oyama's is plums. We're making all kinds of processed plum products, liquors and juices and so on. It's about seeing how much value we can add to a base product and in doing so, increasing the number of different products. It doesn't stop at just one product. Like Mr. Ogata says, in addition to plums, which are a central pillar of the community, the strength of this town lies in the number of other agricultural products also produced. In Oyama, this is called centipede agriculture. A feature of Oyama's agriculture is to grow a few long legs, while also having a large number of different smaller legs. Using the analogy of a centipede's legs for agricultural produce and encouraging an abundance of different products is Oyama's own farming philosophy. Create a few long legs to support the body and lay the foundation. Then add lots of little legs. Regardless of how small and thin they are, they will continue to support the body even if the centipede loses a leg. As a result of this approach, not only does Oyama produce a range of products, but they have also developed new sales methods. Us farmers' wives started it with the open-air market. Did the produce sell? Oh yes, very well. The open-air market was a simple concept whereby surplus household vegetables were sold as is and, as the name suggests, outside under the open skies. Teruko Kurakawa started the market when she was serving as the head of the Women's Association. In Oyama, everyone has land, so there wasn't much point in giving the extra vegetables to our neighbors. The non-farming people living in neighboring Hita City would want them though, wouldn't they? We started selling our surplus household vegetables outside the agricultural cooperative. It was safe food. We didn't use any chemicals. We ended up selling dumplings and all kinds of things. 
Oyama was a pioneer of safe food in Kyushu. Mrs. Kurakawa talks of Oyama's open-air market, the origin of a distribution model that has spread throughout Japan. Providing only two or three products doesn't give the consumer enough choice. It's best that there is a whole range of different products so that consumers can exercise their choice. Oyama's approach to farming, which includes producing many different products in small amounts, began at the open-air market. The open-air market later developed and the concept of a market where the producer's face is visible spread throughout Japan. This is called Chokubaijo, or direct sales farmers markets. Where did you travel from today? We're from Ogori City. This place is great. It's fresh and organic. And that's why we can all shop here. The average farming household has almost no access to information such as who's buying their products or what consumers want. Selling through public wholesale markets requires a certain level of quality and large amounts. This and other requirements, such as set standards for the size and shape of the produce, are high hurdles for small-scale farmers. In Oyama, everyone is equally placed. No winners are made, but there are no losers either. This is a guiding principle of Oyama's farmer's market system. <laughs> Tamiko Mori is one farmer benefiting from the farmer's market system in Oyama. You can sell anything there, even in small amounts. It's good for Oyama. Before, Mrs. Mori had no experience selling processed foods, but now she has a processing plant at her house and produces close to 40 products. Mrs. Mori's customer base continues to grow, with consumers who want homemade products that taste like they were made at home. It's 7.30 a.m., and Yuriko Kurakawa is loading up the car with produce to transport to the farmer's market. This freshness is one of the attractions of the market. Producers bring their produce into the market in the morning, and that night they collect whatever didn't sell during the day. This system is the key to the freshness of the products sold here. Labels carry standard information such as the producer's name, product's name, shipping date, and price. Farmers are free to set their own prices and they select the packaging too. Each individual producer is empowered to decide how, where, and what they will sell each day. A truck also leaves each day to transport goods to the antenna stores outside of Oyama. At the Wasada Antenna Shop, I could sell three packs of my 1,000 yen product. Somehow, a 1,000 yen price tag doesn't often result in sales. At the external stores, it's not selling. Only the 500 yen ones sell. Once a week, the farmers receive a settlement slip from the farmer's market. The slip allows the producer to confirm data related to their products, such as the number of products sold, on what days, and in which store. The farmers look forward to receiving the summary of their sales data every week and work extra hard to see good results. The system allows farmers the opportunity to think about their products. At the same time, it also promotes awareness of product traceability among producers. Changing consumer needs are more easily responded to and innovation in food processing is also promoted. Tamiko Mori has created many hit products under her brand, Tamichan. She talks about how she does it. It's because I make product based on my knowledge of what's said. Isn't it? Obviously. 
If something doesn't sell well, it makes you think, what can I do differently? Or what will sell? It's always like that. I think, definitely. Otherwise, Oyama wouldn't have become as rich as all this. I think it's really good for Oyama's farmers. <laughs> Mrs. Mori's success has received public recognition as her products have won many competitions. She has shown that one person can create strong products. Now her annual income is up to around $150,000. Mrs. Kurokawa, who created the prototype of this system, the open-air market, talks about the reasons behind its success. After all, it is better selling directly from farmers to consumers. It is a better method, isn't it? Direct rather than going through the usual market channels? Consumers and producers get to meet face-to-face. -face. They can even call them directly these days. Direct is best. The secret behind Oyama's success lies in this kind of systematic value addition. Systematic value addition is not only about making processed products with a hive added value. It's about raising the added value of the town as a whole by clarifying the roles of the individual and the collective and by conducting collective activities like collective marketing. There was something else that Oyama did first in order to reach success. In this town, they thought of all kinds of things, but couldn't come up with anything workable. They wondered what was happening in the rest of the country and decided first to see for themselves. After studying other areas, they chose plums and chestnuts. This was a search for something that would sell in the Japanese market, a cash crop. Formerly an employee of the agricultural cooperative, Masateru Kurakawa is now a farmer, cultivating, processing, and selling plums. Umeboshi is a health food eaten by Japanese people since olden times. That's why I grow plums, so that I can make umeboshi that contribute to people's health. Marukin Farms Plums also received recognition by winning the top prize at the National Umeboshi Contest, which is held in Oyama every year and attracts entries from all over Japan. This contest has promoted Oyama's plums throughout the country and was a major turning point in the creation of Oyama's identity as the town of plums. It was actually the idea of an old lady. How about we hold an umeboshi tasting? She was probably good at making umeboshi herself. The response to that idea was like, umeboshi, no way. There's no way that will work. At first, everyone thought that an umeboshi contest was a silly idea. Nobody took it seriously, but even so, Oyama took it on. Before we actually implemented it, we studied it. The more we looked into it, the more interesting umeboshi became. For example, things like a 5,000 yen umeboshi. The more we heard, we began to realize that this was really worth doing. Oyama treated the contest as an opportunity to study quality umeboshi from all over Japan, as well as promote and enhance their own plum industry and change the town's mindset towards the industry. By the time the second competition was held, Oyama's producers had their eye on the first prize and started winning. The quality of plums produced in Oyama became well known throughout Japan and Oyama's brand was established. When Toyoka Yano won first prize in the Umeboshi contest, she didn't have enough product to satisfy demand. 
others came in from all over, although it isn't easy to win. Does something change when a producer wins? It's very encouraging. This event taught us the importance of making a place and mechanism for residents to build their confidence. If we hadn't had this contest, we may not have a plum industry. And if that grandmother hadn't had that idea, I don't think it would have happened. It's very important that community development be open and inclusive. At that time, the market price for raw plums was very high. They were called green diamonds. Oyama has since commercialized the simple plum into dozen of product varieties, with customers lining up from Fukuoka and other neighboring cities. The interesting thing is how Oyama has created a system for making vulnerable farmers strong. By clarifying individual and collective roles and through collective activities, they have achieved high added value for both the individual and the community. Through this, community capacity has been greatly improved. Oyama is now renowned as a successful case of rural development. But in 1961, this was the poorest village in the prefecture. Oyama's inhabitants earned less than one-fifth of their city-dwelling counterparts. Their main source of income was agriculture. Villagers were filled with despair and without hopes or dreams for the future, they accepted their fate apathetically. However, as part of the Plum and Chestnut movement, a one million yen income goal was introduced. With the Plum and Chestnut movement began Oyama's campaign for improving incomes, aiming at $10,000. The charismatic leader, Harumi Yahata, he was head of both the village government and the agricultural cooperative, and through these organizations carried out a major role in supporting the townspeople. It began in 1961. To start a movement, first you need staff. Local government employees made up the industrial division, and the agricultural cooperative staff, the agriculture extension office. At that time, Mr. Kurokawa had graduated from agricultural high school and started working at the agricultural cooperative. He would play a role in the plum and chestnut movement. Kazumi Koda, a former local government employee and someone who contributed much to the movement, reflects back on those days. At the time, we were pushing plums and chestnuts. Farmers didn't have much money, nor did they have much knowledge. There weren't even many people who knew how to plant a tree. With no prior experience in this kind of farming, there were more than a few who were opposed to taking up plums. However, the town was supportive after it was announced that the saplings would be fully subsidized. In order for farmers to be able to participate with a low level of risk, the local government thought about ways to fully support them. In the beginning, each household was provided with plum saplings, free of charge. Also, when the time came to plant, they needed to dig holes in the fields. The town purchased machinery, and the work was done with office staff driving it. The cost to the farming households was limited to a small contribution for gasoline. The biggest issue then was the lack of horticultural skills. The biggest problem was how to skill up the farmers in plum cultivation techniques. To get them to learn the skills, we had agricultural extension workers and the agricultural cooperatives farming instructor leading. A farming guidance assistance system was set up. 
Instruction was provided to a leading farmer in each district, and that leader then lifted up the skills of other farmers in the district. The biggest role of Oyama's town's administration around 1961 was the introduction of plums. The cultivation of plums appeared to go smoothly after that. Skip to five years later, a public works project began in Oyama, and things started to change. Once construction of the Oyama Dam began, people were able to earn more money by working on the dam construction than growing plums, and the increasing number of farmers abandoning their plums was a problem. So the AP system was created. Due to the national government-led dam construction, farmers started abandoning their plum orchards. In response, the local administration introduced AgriPartners. AgriPartners rode on green motorbikes and wore farm work boots and clothes like I'm wearing now. Even though they worked from eight in the morning until five in the afternoon, like any other public office employee, they were not white-collar workers. They would arrive in a farmer's field to mow the grass, spray, and prune. They worked hard at maintaining the fields until dam construction finished. The agri partners looked after other people's fields day in and day out, so that once the construction had finished. The farmers could return to plum farming. It was around that time that Mr. Yahata was both the village head and the chairman of the agricultural cooperative, so there wasn't really a distinction between the two. But everyone did the same things. It was a single line with one shared goal. Everyone participated. This is the kind of thing that led to the success of today's plum and chestnut movement. This was for the fiscal year of 1978. Before that, things weren't so good. See, but here, income was something like ten thousand and something dollars just for January. Is that sales? That's sales. Plums are harvested only once per year, which means that there is no steady continuous income. Oyama started working on crop diversification. The result, enoki mushrooms. As an enoki mushroom producer, Teruko Kurakawa increased her income significantly. In 1972, my husband and his friends found enoki mushrooms. The following year, we started growing them. With the annual harvest of plums and chestnuts, there's no security, so they went looking for something that could be harvested all year round. They found enoki mushrooms in Nagano. Then the agricultural cooperative started growing the spores in sawdust and distributing these to farmers. That way, it's not too risky for farmers. And they don't need to invest a lot either. They cultivated spores in a bottle, and gradually sold these to more and more farmers. Oyama's enoki mushroom cultivation system is easy for anyone to participate in. Usually, the spores take around one month to take, and then another month until they're ready. So, around two months. That first month is taken care of by the agricultural cooperative. Then, once it's done, farmers take over. These are the ones I picked up today. This is what they look like. For the first month, the cultivation of enoki mushrooms is a complicated process which requires special skills. Actually, it would be very hard for individual small-scale farmers to do the whole process. Therefore, the agricultural cooperative does the part of the process that requires a high level of skills, and after that, the farmers take over cultivation, packaging, and distribution. This is an example of clarifying the division of roles between the individual 
and organization. Thanks to this division of roles, even those producers with no experience were able to grow enoki mushrooms easily. Produced by many Oyama farmers, Oyama's brand name of enoki mushrooms, mashiruku, were distributed widely in the Kyushu market. Agriculture in Oyama was successful, due not only to the development of high value added products, but as a result of the creation of a system whereby collective activities are systematically conducted by strong institutions. Oyama went from being the poorest village in Oita Prefecture half a century ago to one of the richest areas with farmers whose incomes are now higher than many typical farming households could even imagine. Oyama did not focus only on product development. Human resource development was progressed simultaneously. The foundations for human development were laid with the introduction of an effective means of communication with the town's people. Cable radio broadcasting. To install a receiver in every household, the agricultural cooperative encouraged people to deposit more savings with the cooperative. Once savings increased, they were able to install a small speaker in every house. Announcements were made several times a day. There is a funny story. The older people wondered how a voice could come from those small speakers. Mr. Ogata, who was in charge of communications at the town administration, talks about how the cable radio broadcasts helped to change people's mindsets, which in turn contributed to Oyama's development. Community development is about building a system able to respond to a changing world. I think there's a lot that needs to be done to do that, but the most important thing is the mindset of the people living there. I think changing their mindset is really key. Information reached people through the radio. Repeated daily, this information permeated throughout the population until a shared awareness and understanding was born. Every morning at five, the radio would chime, ping, 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 and good morning. It was like, let's escape from our poverty-stricken lifestyles through the plum and chestnut movement. Plant plums and chestnuts, and let's aim for seven-digit agriculture, one million yen incomes. Every morning the farmers were given a dream, and this motivated them. Later, a cable TV station was introduced in the town hall building, and broadcast only information relevant to Oyama. Well done. You did a good job. Now that you've returned, what are your impressions? Firstly, I'm glad to have arrived back safely. And I'm really grateful to everyone for this valuable experience. This is footage from interviews with young trainees returning from an exchange program to a collective farming community in Israel, which is called a kibbutz. Human resource development in Oyama included actively dispatching young people overseas to undertake training. In 1969, three young people were the first to be sent to Israel on the scholarship program. Mr. Koda, at the time an employee of the local administration, was one of them. We actually went for three months. We decided to go to study the kibbutz as they had a very efficient form of agriculture. We found that their system was very logical. Mr. Koda and the other trainees adopted parts of the kibbutz style after they returned. The ideas they brought back were not limited to agricultural systems, but also changed their attitudes and lifestyles. Build the community center 
and in their spare time, people can participate in club activities. For that, you need leisure time. So, we came up with the three-day weekend. The three-day weekend involves increased efficiency to free up leisure time. It meant fundamentally changing agricultural and the farming household's lifestyle. Teruko Kurakawa talks about when she first heard about the reform from Harumi Yahata. Well, I was surprised. What? Three days off? It would be like, aren't we farmers? Housewives especially are always running here, there, and everywhere. I thought it would never happen. Work hard and aim to finish by about three in the afternoon, then go shopping or something. As requested by Mayor Yahata, Mrs. Kurakawa went about creating leisure activities. She also was deployed on overseas training and brought back processing know-how from the United States of America. I was so surprised that over there, processed goods were being made by primary producers. Secondary industry is processing, right? But they were even going so far as tertiary industry and marketing the products themselves. They even have their own shops. From this time on, based on inspiration they found overseas, Oyama residents amped up their search for a better life for themselves. An example of this kind of fun activity a sporting event called Ohio, or Good Morning Softball. Former town employee Mr. Ogata proposed the project. This was my first job. I was concerned about the generation gap. To try to replace that gap with something shared, we made the teams with mixed age groups. The team members' combined ages had to add up to over 250 years. Softball became just as popular with older age groups as it did with young people. Many teams participated from each district. Because of the mixed age requirements, the participation of varied ages became both necessary and possible. The tournament deepened the bonds between community members and became a major source of fun in this mountain village which historically had few leisure activities available. The truth is, in the beginning, when I took my proposal in, he said, You've written an interesting proposal, haven't you? I'm not really satisfied with the three outcomes of this project you have identified. But it's interesting, so you can do it. Let's prepare a budget. In return, I'd like you to be prepared, as I'll be calling you back here in a year's time to provide me with a fourth and fifth outcome of this project. Was that Mr. Yahata? Yes, the mayor. Mr. Ogata racked his brains trying to figure out what the answer should be. But after one year, he couldn't find the right answer. He was told that if he didn't have an answer the following year, he would be better off quitting his job in the town administration. At first, when softball was introduced, it was a very big craze. But for some reason, in the second year, the softball craze began to calm down. Softball team members started doing other things. For example, why don't we start up a beer garden to fund community center repairs? Or let's buy a mountain together. Oh, I get it. This is the kind of outcome, isn't it? Mr. Ogata, who had rushed to let Mayor Yahata know, was told the following. Right, you understand now. You don't do activities for the sake of activities. Think of it as a means, not an end. This was Mr. Ogata's first-hand experience of community human resource development under Mayor Yahata.
Oyama has sent human resources to all corners of the globe for training and gaining experience. While this was Mayor Yahata's information collecting method, those who participated have also played central roles in progressing Oyama's reforms. It has been over 50 years since the development efforts began. Even now, Oyama is continuing to progress various activities. A green tourism hands-on rice harvesting activity. Children from urban areas regularly come to visit on school excursions to experience farming and the farmer's lifestyle firsthand. Mrs. Mori also participates as a green tourism host. It's a lot of fun. More than being serious about it. We're just having fun with the kids. What does participating in this kind of activity mean for children? It's part of their education. And I think we're cooperating in that. I'm from Kitakyushu. It's not really the city, it's not really the country, it's in between. Oyama is quite country, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> Oyama, whose plum and chestnut movement was once said to be impossible, has continued to evolve as a model for rural development. Although Oyama's development has matured, there are still new development activities being pursued, such as promoting green tourism, establishing the biggest rhododendron garden in western Japan, and the introduction of a new agricultural system as a corporation. In the spirit of those first reforms, Oyama's descendants continue to strive for a better Oyama with a passion that has not dimmed in 50 years. <laughs>